My name's Melissa Leach and I'm the director here at IDS and I've also been very involved in the work we've done with many partners on Zoonoses and One Health over the last few years. And it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome you all here today and especially to welcome the um, colleagues and friends who've come from a very, very long way, um, parts of Africa and parts of Asia. And thank you to the DSA for the support and the ASRC for the support they've offered to enable that to, to happen. So this is the first of a series of workshops that the UK Development Studies Association um, decided a few months ago to, to launch to think about how um, big global challenges can be met through research that involves development studies perspectives and that brings what development studies has to offer um, and particularly the social science perspectives that come from it together with both people from other technical disciplines and also policymakers, practitioners, those in society, so we can really move ahead. And I think the, the context for this is that um, we're seeing both challenges becoming more and more important and a lot of investment in them, especially in the UK. Actually, Britain is putting a lot of funding through our UK research and innovation, a new combined set of councils, um, things like the Global Challenges Research Fund, which are trying, saying they're doing interdisciplinary work. And we really wanted, I'm really speaking for Sarah here, Sarah could be saying all of this, so correct me if there's a different narrative here, um, that we felt development studies had a great deal to offer and it would be good to have a series of workshops to think about it. So there will be a number happening, supported by the DSA over the next few months. Why did we choose zoonoses? for this first in a series which is about um, development science and, and challenges. Um, in some respects, one might think Zoonosis is a little bit of a narrow, slightly arcane topic, probably not for the people in this room because you all work on this. But if you're a, a development studies person or a funder, you might think Zoonosis, diseases that jump from animals to people, why is this a useful focus? Why should we be concerned? And what's it got to do with development? Well, what I want to suggest now is that studying zoonoses and taking forward One Health approaches to deal with them really badly need development studies and the kind of interdisciplinary development science um, that development studies can help to promote. On the other hand, by looking at zoonoses and digging into the opportunities and the challenges around doing interdisciplinary work around zoonoses, we can actually learn a lot of broader relevance to other challenges. So that's the kind of double, double argument I'd like to sort of bring out at the start of the day. So zoonoses are and can be seen as a major global challenge in themselves and a development issue. So you've got around the wall here the SDG goals, we might see zoonotic disease as relevant to the health goal, but it's interlinked with many of the others, um, more even than are, are marked on this diagram. Um, interactions between the achievements of these other goals and um, tackling zoonoses. So in a way, I think we can see zoonoses as sitting as a bit of a nexus of different sustainable development goals. And that's the first reason why at development studies people might want to be concerned about them. Secondly, of course, zoonoses are part of and present a major global health challenge. So this is just a quick map from a few years ago of emerging um, and re-emerging infectious diseases, part of the global public health challenges that the world is facing and seeking to tackle. Um, and we know from the pioneering and now very well cited work of people like Kate Jones at UCL, even from a decade ago, that um, nearly two thirds of these emerging, zoonotic, emerging disease events are related to, zoo to zoonoses. Um, the update of that work, which was published more recently, underlines that message even further. And then of course, in 2014 to 16, we saw the major Ebola outbreak, Ebola being a zoonotic disease potentially linked to bats, but debate about it, um, which caused major mortality and has left societies and individuals struggling with, with the social and the health fallout. So um, zoonotic diseases, because of all of this, hit the headlines very frequently. 
and sometimes become linked and sort of prominent on the global stage and in the media in terms of what we at IDS have come to think of as a kind of global outbreak narrative. This idea that somehow out there in the world, in these hot spots, often in Africa, in Asia, there are diseases that are waiting to emerge and then have the potential to spread really rapidly in a world of mobile people and microbes and global travel to infect other places, including centers of power. And this, of course, is some of the reasoning um, behind the enormous global attention and media attention and indeed fictionalized Hollywood attention and the panic in a way and the fear about zoonotic disease. But of course, this is only part of the story and a part of the story that, that I think we might want to critique and question because perhaps more significantly, zoonoses are also deeply interlocked with questions of poverty and present health and public health and poverty challenges to people living in those places. And, and so while there's a global concern, there are also some really important local concerns, which would say, if there are hotspots, they matter for the people who are living in them. Um, and this was just a, a map that emerged from some of the work that DFID commissioned a few years ago around mapping poverty and zoonoses and finding correlations geographically in terms of where zoonotic disease emerges. Um, and if this is a concern, it's also one that we're seeing emerging policy frameworks and, and global discourses attempting to deal with. So um, if we're seeing zoonoses as about the interdependence of human health, which they clearly are, but also animal health and diseases that are carried by animals in different ways and transfer to people. And these are also situated in ecologies, whether they're urban or rural. Then over the last couple of decades, we've seen that recognition embodied in attempts at integrated policy to deal with them. Whether we're talking about the work on eco-health and environment and health, which goes back several decades, to the slightly more recent interactions um, under the framework of One Health, um, supported by the World Health Organization, the OIE, and various conservation agencies, or in the most recent incarnation, ideas about planetary health. Um, and this is just the logo from the Lancet Commission, which um, is also arguing about the interactions in the deeply embedded health of people and human civilization, as they put it, and the natural and ecological systems on, on which they depend. So there's a lot of global policy interest in zoonoses and One Health, and zoonoses as an archetype issue which require One Health approaches. But I think we might want to begin to ask about some other ways in which development is relevant. So there are several. And what we found in our work, first of all, is that the dynamics of zoonotic diseases, how they emerge, how they spread, um, who they affect and why, are deeply entangled with many other dynamics and processes of change that are part of development and part of capitalist change and have been studied by development studies. So these are just a list which will be familiar. Um, in a way, one can't understand zoonoses without beginning to look at this kind of issue. I think we might also want to suggest that development studies, and by this I mean a very broad set of normatively related concerns with processes of socioeconomic change, actually offer some key questions and perspectives which also matter to how we understand zoonoses. Um, firstly, that they draw our attention not just to the technical, the health, the veterinary matters, which are, of course, of critical importance, and I'm really pleased that we have people in the room who can bring those to our attention, but also a focus on the social, the economic, the political drivers, consequences that are entangled with those things. I think a second is an interest in not just these big global patterns, which again are important, but how they play out on the ground, in particular localities, <coughs> the dynamics of what one might call people in places, and a perspective that asks about what they mean from the bottom up. What does a big hotspot map actually mean in terms of the people in those places living with the dynamics in an everyday way of ecosystems and livelihood change? 
Then related to that, development studies has always been concerned with this question of distribution, access, control, who gets what and when, political economy, if you like. And I think we need to ask these questions around zoonoses, perhaps the question of who gets sick and why, um, in what places. So this draws our attention to questions of power and political economy, uh, an integral part of development science and thinking, and to questions about the politics of knowledge, whose knowledge counts, whose narratives prevail. Is it the global outbreak narrative? Is it the view of the policymaker? Is it the view of the vet or the environmental scientist? Is it the view of the, the woman living in a, in a village? And this then relates, of course, to what is also part and parcel of development studies, which is a normative lens. We're not just about studying the world for the sake of knowing more about it, but also to try and influence things for the better. A very broad definition of development is good change. We have to ask about who defines good, in what ways, in what places, but also think about how the work we're doing is contributing to change. So those, I think, to me, are some, some aspects of development studies, and I think they offer some vital perspectives and questions to the way we might go about exploring zoonoses. So very quickly, here is an example of a program of work which tried to apply some of these questions. And there are several people <laughs> in this room, um, including Sally Bukachi, who were involved in that project, um, and some of you are there in this picture. So um, this was a very large team, and it was very interdisciplinary. I think there were 19 institutions involved um, from five African countries and several institutions in the UK. It was supported by um, the Ecosystem Services for Poverty Alleviation program, which was a multiple UK research council and DFID program, that in many ways, I think, was a precursor to some of the funding we're now seeing under global challenges and did very much say, let's have proper interdisciplinary development science. So that's what we tried to do, asking these questions. These were the objectives. What we were interested in was new cutting edge development science on the relationships between ecosystems and health and poverty with an aim to try and manage ecosystems in ways that reduced the risks of zoonotic disease, particularly to people who were living in poverty and marginalization. Um, and that, we thought, needed new knowledge and could bring some new policy implications. And we worked on these four diseases in five settings, um, chosen because they all had relevance to poverty and to local public health concerns, and they sat in different ecological settings um, in the African continent. But critically, what we tried to do was build and then take forward a thoroughly interdisciplinary conceptual framework. And this involved um, veterinary scientists, medical scientists, environmental scientists, and social scientists working together in field teams and then coming together to do joint analysis um, around the relationships between people and their well-being, ecosystems, and disease dynamics locally as shaped by drivers at different scales. And we also had a big theme, which was about whose knowledge counts, who's saying what about these diseases. And we tried to bring together um, what we came to call three different modeling approaches or methodologies, taking on the one hand the big ecological pattern-based models coming out of environmental science. On the other hand, the process-based mathematical epidemiological models that were being produced in the field by modelers and then what we called participatory models, which would draw on techniques of social science and participatory research to elicit and work with community members' own understandings of people, wildlife, ecological disease interactions. Um, and this produced some findings that I think wouldn't necessarily have emerged without interdisciplinarity and without that people in places focus. So for instance, our work on trypanosomiasis, sleeping sickness, um, in Zimbabwe revealed that actually what mattered was not a broad landscape that you would then spray to get rid of tsetse fly, but actually particular patches in that landscape where we found high concentrations of tsetse fly, but also the people who were using them were from particular social groups 
It was poor hunters, it was women gathering food, it was livestock herders, often children. So the message from this was actually we need to target better. We need to understand these patches in landscapes <coughs> and focus efforts around tsetse eradication on those and work with the people whose livelihoods are dependent on those ecological patches because they're those who are vulnerable and can give us clues as to what to do. Um, a related kind of story emerged from our work on Lassa fever in Sierra, Sierra Leone. Um, Hard-hitting, um, devastating hemorrhagic fever endemic across a large swathe of West Africa um, where the maps show the mastomies um, rodent that transmits Lassa and large areas which are potential um, ecological niches for this disease. By focusing in, in this interdisciplinary way, on the dynamics of particular settings, we revealed some other vulnerabilities. Um, and one of the key ones was that women are particularly vulnerable to Lassa fever risk in their vegetable gardens in the dry season. Um, and this relates to the importance of dry season gardens to women's livelihoods, to their independent income, to the gender dynamics of relationships within households, um, and also to the fact that they're digging around in soils and weeding just at the time when our rodent trapping found that mastomies were present in those fields. So this begins to give us a clue to a question about who might get sick and why, which we've then followed up with sampling. So that's a very brief summary. Some of the different things that emerge. So what we begin to gain through this kind of local focus and interdisciplinary focus is an understanding of this middle point of who gets sick, where and why. More differentiated and perhaps more useful to beginning to target interventions in a way which might work. Um, we also began to see that actually if you want to tackle any of these zoonoses, you begin to need a, an integrated approach, which um, is bringing together people who are working in the veterinary or the livestock sectors with those with ministries who are dealing with environment as well as those dealing with human health. And whether it's in policy interventions or, or, or practices which can perhaps deal with pest control and, and rodent control and disease control at the same time, um, there were opportunities to work together. And then I think probably a key message which came out of the, the special journal issue that we did um, for Phil Trans and the book that we put together on One Health um, is something about One Health for the real world. It's all very well to bring together the big agencies and to look at planetary health at a global scale. But actually, if we want to have One Health approaches that work, they need to be rather better embedded in the everyday and real world national and local policy and practice settings in which people are living and policymakers and practitioners have to operate. So this kind of message about One Health for the real world came through. Um, it's unfinished business. Some of these projects are still continuing and it'd be great to talk with the partners in the room about where some of these things are going. But what finally are some bigger lessons that we might draw. Thinking about this in advance of this workshop, I think there are two sets that certainly I take from this project and from others, whereby what we learn about trying to do this kind of zoonosis work might give us some clues to things we need to think about more broadly in bringing development science to global challenges. So the first set of lessons are about interdisciplinarity, bringing together different scientific disciplines. And I think the first lesson is that it's vital. We're dealing with complex challenges here and they have technical and social and ecological dimensions. And we need the, the multiple perspectives that different sciences can bring and the methods that they can bring to begin to untangle those complexities. But in this, we very often in global challenges research see the technical sciences as in the lead. It's environmental science, it's natural science, which sets the question, sets the agenda. And the social sciences are brought in almost to answer the behavioral questions. Tell us a bit about cultural context. Tell us a bit about the social factors. I think there's actually a reversal and a balancing up of equity that needs to happen, whereby we're seeing social science and development studies approaches as sometimes in the lead, which they were in this program, or at least as equal partners 
where you're co-creating the questions and co-delivering on the frameworks and the approaches. And this also then enables us to bring multiple methods together in a more equitable way. But I think one of the lessons I really learned from drivers of disease is that it's not possible necessarily to integrate them. You take epidemiological, ecological, participatory modeling, and they tell one different things. And I think the holy grail of interdisciplinary work isn't necessarily to come up with the lowest common denominator that integrates everything into some, some kind, of, kind of soup in a way, but actually to triangulate, to say participation and social science tells us about this, epidemiological model te modeling tells us about this, ecological modeling tells us about this. And then we can triangulate, triangulate and have more of a deliberative conversation about what we're learning. Doing this brings an awful lot of challenges, and I think this is part of what we'll talk about today, so I won't elaborate. But these are just some of them. They're to do with language, they're to do with the incentives in our institutions and for ourselves as individuals. They're to do with hierarchies, established hierarchies often about disciplines. They're about sometimes feeling that um, interdisciplinary work is about making compromises and maybe not pursuing the purity of one's work as an anthropologist or as a, as a climate scientist um, and, and making those compromises and actually tackling some of these really quite deeply embedded silos which tend to mean that disciplines work separately. <coughs> and there are many more and I think one of the things we want to do today is talk about how we can overcome these and others. But then there's another set of challenges <coughs> which are crucial to global challenges, which are about what you could call transdisciplinarity. Not just working amongst sciences, but then taking forward research that works with actors in society. And at IDS these days, this is very much part of the approach that we take across all of our work as a development studies institution tackling global challenges. And we call it engaged excellence or engaged research. And we think about four pillars to that work, which are all dependent on each other. So you absolutely need high quality research, that goes without saying. But often to make that quality and to link it to real world contexts, we try to co-construct that knowledge with policymakers, citizens, practitioners, so that we're working together to co-design the questions, co-collect the data, co-communicate the results. Um, and that helps very often to embed impact and pathways towards it, not as an add-on at the end, but as part and parcel of a research process. And all of this um, depends on partnerships, partnerships between institutions, between places, between people who are working in different scientific areas and um, across practice areas. Um, again, this isn't easy, and we'll move this afternoon to think about some of these challenges and how, how they can be overcome. I think some of them are simply because it requires patience and it requires skills in facilitation and interaction that aren't just natural. They sometimes have to be learnt and they have to be taught. They involve working with teams that are often dispersed geographically, different parts of the world, different settings. That brings some very practical management challenges and some cultural challenges and interpersonal challenges about building relationships. Um, and sometimes this involves risks, risks to careers, sometimes even risks to personal safety. We shouldn't put aside the fact that some of these settings where we're working on zoonoses are, are fragile and they bring risks of disease and other things. And finally, it's risky because a lot of this is quite political. What we're talking about in development science to tackle global challenges is sometimes speaking different kinds of truths and realities to embedded power relations and incumbent ways of doing things by governments, by international agencies. And we end up engaging in politics and power relations. And that's not easy. But I think we have to do it. And we have to do it in a way that also says, who are we, acknowledges our own positionalities. And that requires a degree of humility. So I hope we'll talk about a lot of this today. My conclusion is that this kind of thing we're talking about, interdisciplinary engaged development science, is really difficult, but it's really vital. So we need to get some of these things right. Um, 
I think that it's more difficult and more important for zoonoses and One Health than for many other issues. So in a way, we can see zoonoses as a kind of archetype issue to focus this discussion of bigger challenges on. Um, and if we can overcome some of these challenges for zoonoses, um, it will bring us important wider lessons that we can then take to the bigger communities tackling other challenges. So that's why I'm really excited about today's debate and looking forward to the discussions, which I think can focus in on zoonoses, but take us in some of these bigger directions as part of this series. <laughs>